I don't know how to describe it other than like like a demon type of sound. But it's silhouetted, hulking, every bit of five and a half feet wide, 13 to 14 foot tall, pitch black. The one thing that ran through my mind when I had this encounter was I don't have a big enough gun. Your host, two-time witness and field researcher for more than 40 years, William Jevnik. Welcome to Creek Devil. Hello everyone, welcome to another edition of Creek Devil. We have two very special guests today, Cody and Larry Batson. And for those who don't know who Larry Batson is, we've talked about a story. Uh, it's one of my, my favorite stories that were written uh, Larry used to talk with Bob Titmus and John Green quite often, and Bob Titmus related an account uh, of being, you know, out in the Bluff Creek area about three years before the Patterson film was taken. So in the same place, and it looked like the same creature. So uh, I know we've had Jim read that story on one of the shows. So for everybody, you know, if you want to check that out, and I'm sure uh, Larry might talk about that. So Tom. I'm going to have you take the lead and uh, get us started here. Okay, great. Um, Larry, how are you doing? Uh, you and I haven't spoken yet, and uh, just want to kind of do a quick introduction. I'm doing great. How are you? Very good. Very good. And Cody, how are you doing this morning? Uh, afternoon, very, your time, though. <laughs> yeah, I'm doing very well, thanks. Great. Uh, Cody, let's start with you. You sent me some pictures, and you've got some activity. And uh, you said you hadn't, uh, you didn't have an actual sighting, which is fine. But you're getting plenty of evidence, so um, yeah, go ahead and jump in and and uh, fill us in. Well, I, I'm getting there. Uh, I, I haven't found as much as I would like, of course, but uh, but yeah, we've. Uh, I think we've uh, narrowed down a small family group uh, near a body of water in a state forest in Southern Indiana. And uh, we found, uh, actually just yesterday, I found a nine inch footprint impression. And uh, we found some hair and uh, some various trackways. So, so we're pretty excited. We're still digging, you know, it's, I think uh, last night I had a, a rock thrown at me for the first time. So that was uh, interesting. Okay, uh, tell us a little bit about, that's kind of, that is interesting, so tell us a little bit about what led up to it, and uh, the location, not, you don't have to give the exact location, but, you know, kind of describe the area, and um, what was your response? Sure, sure, uh, so we, we actually arrived uh, early afternoon and hiked down, and it's where we found the tracks, I uh we spent uh, most of the day going down into the ravines and following creek beds and, and looking for sign. But uh, when we got back, some of the, uh, there are a few uh, Bigfoot uh, research groups in the area. And they were sitting up in the parking lot when we got back. And so we decided to sit out with those folks. And uh, their idea of research is a little different than, than mine, but uh, they're very nice folks. So we, we sat and uh, they, they played this uh distressed rabbit call once it got dark and at, towards the end of the call I had uh, something uh, come through the trees and land next to me and uh, I thought they were uh, messing with me but uh, turns out they weren't so that's exciting okay so that was kind of where I was going with this uh, so when the rock was tossed at you this was, you think it might have been in, in response to the distress rabbit call. And more importantly, um, everybody was present and accounted for uh, when this happened, correct? Correct, yeah. Okay. Yeah, they, so they, didn't, they don't venture too far from the parking lot. Okay. Um, any follow up? What? How big was this rock? Uh, it was. Probably the size of one of those large grapes. You know, it was it wasn't really large. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so a good sized pebble. Yeah, yeah. Oh, okay, interesting. And was there any follow up to that? Any additional rocks? Any sounds of any kind? Uh, creature walking, or is it just? That? Uh, no, uh, actually, 
we were very disappointed. A uh, there was a group of about four four by four ATVs with like multiple seats and probably I don't know two or three dozen people all drinking that came barreling down our access road uh, about five minutes after that happened and kind of derailed our whole evening. But uh, you know what are you gonna do? I uh, I did capture the whole thing on my audio recorder, so I. You can hear the rock kind of uh, skipping through and landing. And so I've got a friend uh, kind of enhancing the audio and playing around with it. So hopefully I'll have something kind of cool to work with. Yeah. Uh, good, good. And if you send that to us, we'll we'll post it on the website. Sure. Um, so did anybody else in the group in the parking lot uh, notice the rock? Oh, sure. Yeah. Yeah, the my uh, my cousin that was sitting next to me did, and as well as his girlfriend. So, hey, Larry, let me ask. Uh, yeah. when, when it threw the rock, was it trying to actually hit you, or just send you a warning? Uh, my interpretation was was kind of a warning. I, I don't think it really liked the the call that they were playing. It, it didn't hit me. It just landed next to me. Yeah, I think that's. Uh not necessarily dangerous. I think that's more of an attention getting. Yeah, I, uh, I usually focus my research during the day. And uh, so that was my first time kind of sitting out at night and, and, and trying some of these things that other folks were doing. So it, it was an interesting experience. Larry, can you tell us a little bit about Titmus and anything that he told you uh, back in his day, like hit, like hit some of his stories? Uh, Bob was, um, I met Bob in his latter years. He was, when I met him, he wasn't the greatest of health. In fact, what had happened to leading up to that is I was doing a project for an outdoor, uh, exhibit, outdoor show on Bigfoot and Sasquatch. And I wanted to get some things from Willow Creek, California, because that's basically the Bigfoot capital of the world. And I called Al Hodgson at Hodgson's Variety Store. And he proceeded to tell me that they had, you know, mugs and things we could use for the exhibit, uh, souvenirs. And I asked him, I said, uh, Al, I said, uh, do you know of anyone that's actually seen a Bigfoot? He said, well, there was a, c- a couple guys through here a while back. Hold on, let me, t- I, they left their number, I'll get it for you. So he comes back to the phone and he gives me these two numbers. One happens to be Bob Titmus. And the other is John Green from Harrison Hot Springs, uh, British Columbia, who is the godfather of Bigfoot, basically. Of course, when I made that call to him the first time, I wasn't really um, aware of that so much. And we got to talking, and uh, he said, you need to talk to my neighbor, Bob Titmus. He says he lives about three streets over. So I called Bob up, and at first he wasn't very talkative, and I don't know, five minutes or so, we got to. He, he opened up a little bit, and I finally asked him. I said, "Bob, I said, have you ever seen a Bigfoot?" And he got real quiet. He says, "Yes." He said, I've, "I've I've seen him twice." He says, "One was off the coast of Alaska, and once one was in British Columbia." I said, "Well, can you tell me a little bit about that?" And he said, "Well." The first one was 1941 along the Wrangell Narrows in southeast Alaska. And uh, we were cruising down along the Narrows in our ship. And most of the guys were down in the ship playing cards or eating. He says, I decided I want to go up above and take a look at this beautiful Alaskan scenery. So he's, it's just about dusk, and he looks along the shoreline, and he can see this uh, animal, creature, whatever, walking along the shoreline and up into the bush. He would talk for, oh, maybe 10, 15, 20 seconds. But he had a perfect description of it. He said he's had a large head, large shoulders, long arms, uh, chestnut brown in color. And in his own words, he said that he had killed and, and stuffed just about every animal native to Alaska except one of those things. So he had decided when he got out of the Navy that's what's going to be his pursuit was to pursue the Bigfoot, the Sasquatch. Well, in 1963, out outside of Kitimat, British Columbia, he walked out of a clearing up, and there was this huge rock wall in front of him, and he observed 
three of them, a large one, a medium size, and a baby, basically freestyle rock climbing this wall, kind of like the guys do in Yosemite with the chalk and little spindly guys that have probably 1% of fat on their bodies. And uh, he said it took them about uh, 20, 25 minutes to go over that wall. He says it was unbelievable how quickly they did that. And then the story that you're talking about earlier that occurred, uh, he basically told Roger Patterson and Bob Gimlin about the Bluff Creek area. Well, Roger, uh, Bob was just kind of tagging along. He, he had the, the horses and the equipment, and Roger had the enthusiasm for Bigfoot. Bob did not. And um, he basically told him about the Bluff Creek area. Well, he had been in there earlier, and he got back in the forest, and uh, Bob was quite the tracker. I mean, he he would look for any small piece of hair, footprints, he just got so wrapped up in what he was doing, he realized it was almost dark. Well, in those rainforests, if you go trying to wander around there in the dark, you, you'll get yourself in trouble and because there's people who've been lost in those forests and never been found again. So what he did is he just dug a pit to lay in because it's going to be cold that night. And he covered himself up with leaves and so forth and debris. And about one thirty, two o'clock in the morning, he could hear something coming through the forest. Now, first... He thought, he listened, he, he thought, he feared it might be elk. And if it was a herd of elk, he said, those, those hoods are like razor blades. He said, they could have trampled him to death. But, at, but he's listening care, uh, closer, and he could tell it was walking on two legs. And as it got closer, it, it just basically stopped, smelled the air, because it could it could smell him, but it couldn't figure out where he was. So all night, it just basically walked back and forth through the forest, throwing rocks, breaking tree limbs, screaming. And then about daylight, uh, it left. Well, he climbed out of that pit, and he told me, he said, Larry, he said, where this thing had been walking back and forth through the forest, it looked like a bulldozer had gone through there. All the small trees had been knocked over and... And, you know, it, 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 was, it was very impressive. Well, when he went down to Bluff Creek after Roger Patterson and Bob Gimlin came back with the film, and they showed it at the University of British Columbia, and all the scientists said it was hokum, um, he knew he had to go down to Bluff Creek. Because when, when he first saw the film, he thought it was over with. It was done. There's the evidence we need. Here's the film footage of it. That's proof that the creature exists. But when the scientists, you know, were complete opposite of that, he knew he had to go to Bluff Creek and get more evidence. And he did. He got several uh, foot castings. And, uh, but when he looked at that track, he realized that was the same animal that he had experienced that night he was in that pit, it was a 16-inch track, same track. He could tell. So that was that was Patty then. It was the same yeah, same yeah, track. Yeah. Oh wow. Yeah, he's pretty certain of it. Yeah, he was pretty he was pretty uh, certain of that that it was uh, what they now call Patty. Yeah. Were there other uh, tracks there from a, from an, another animal like Patty's like Patty's group? Bob Gimlin had told me that they had found three different sizes of footprints in that general area. And, you know, a lot of people, when they look at that film, the, the, one of the arguments is, well, it stays out in the open. Why did you just w walk up into the trees and disappear? I said, well, have you ever heard of the bird with a broken wing trick? Because I'm telling you right now, if you see one, there's two, three, four, five that you don't see. And basically, I mean, what they, the thoughts were is that it was trying to lead those guys away from the other two that they'd been finding footprints from. And that, that, was, the, that was the thought behind that. Because, and, and if you look at the Patterson film, I mean, of course, we've all looked at it a thousand times. Every frame's been examined. It's been scrutinized. I mean, some guys are just silly about it. But if you just look at it and... and realize because there had been a flood that had gone through that area not too long, long before that and it never ever ever looks at the ground never 
look straight ahead. Now, if you were wearing a costume, you would have to look at the ground to make sure you don't trip over a rock or a log or something like that. But this thing, had that, that, that just didn't occur. It just didn't happen. And Bob found that trail. He found those footprints, and he, he followed that trail up on to the side of the, that uh, hill or small mountain there that you see on the right side. And he could see where it stopped. And he said there was rocks about the size of golf balls that were covered with green algae. And you could see where it set its heels in and its buttocks and sat down. And from that vantage point, it had a complete view of that valley. In other words, when Roger and Bob were making those foot castings, this thing was watching them. I just want to, um, Larry, this time, I just want to comment. And that was a real good um, perspective on Patty, not looking down at the ground, but <clears throat> just walking naturally. Uh, somebody in a suit uh, would probably have to, uh, you know, get their bearings, so to speak, make sure they don't stumble and fall, you know, not step on rocks or trip over something. Yeah, very good, very good point. Yeah, well, of course, there's the old point. Why would Roger Patterson and Bob Gimlin build a suit with breasts on it? I mean, why would they go to that detail? And, right. You know, that's, <laughs> that's just fairly obvious. I mean, my God. But um, I've worked with primates for over 40 years. I've worked with, been around chimps, orangutans, uh, currently work with baboons. And when I observe this, this film footage, I do not see a man in a suit at all. I mean, because there's nothing that it walks differently. The length of the arms is different. The length from the elbow to the shoulders is different than man. And none of it uh, adds up to being a hoax whatsoever. And here's the final deal. Bob Gimlin, you know, Roger passed about two years after this was shot. But Bob Gimlin, of course, he's still with us. He caught so much flap over this over the years, in the 70s and the 80s, that he basically shut up about it. And it would be human nature, if it had been a hoax, that after a while, Bob would have said, I'm done with it. Hey, we had a guy in a suit out there. Forget about it, man. And he never said that. And if he sit down and talk with him today, he will tell his interpretation of what exactly happened. It has not changed in all these years. Not at all. Sure, that's a real good point. I hadn't thought of that. Um, you know, that really makes sense. If this had been a hoax, he would have come out at some point just to make the pain go away. And he didn't. And I also no. uh, saw an interview uh, regarding him. This was some time ago. And, and he was offered a million dollars by a major, I guess, uh, production network. Hey, look, if, if, this, is, if this was a hoax... Come out and say it now, and we'll give you a million bucks, okay? And now, you know, you're going to be set for life. And yeah. he didn't even bat an eye. He said, hey, listen, I appreciate it. Just go ahead and keep your million bucks. Um, and, and just went on. And, and uh, he's a real man of character, integrity and character. Well, he is. And, uh, you know, there's, there's so much to that film. In fact, I had a point I was going to. And I completely forgot it. But uh, I've argued for this film for years, and it's just uh, uh, nobody that, that, that says it's a hoax has a good argument for that. They, they, they just don't have it. And, it's, 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 and, you know, here's the point I was going to bring up. R Rene DeHinden basically harassed Bob Gimlin so much over his copyright of that film that Bob got so fed up with it after a while. I think he sold it to him. I think John Green told me he sold it to him for like $2, something like that. And uh, that's how uh, Rene got half of the film rights. But here's the thing. They can never collect on it because it's been shown on so, so many uh, documentaries and different Bigfoot programs. It's, it's public domain now. There's no way, if people give anyone money for it, uh, uh, Roger's wife, it's just out of kindness, because they wouldn't have to. It's all public domain. 
You mind if I jump in a moment, fellas? I, I just wanted to add a, a few things to that. Um, yeah, you know, I, I spoke with Bob Gimlin a few times. Oh, geez, it was probably early, mid-90s. And he was, you know, you're right, Larry, he was really fed up with all this stuff. And I, I told him, I said, you know, you really deserve your recognition in this. You really should come out and talk about it. And, and thank goodness he did. Um, sometime after that, he really, you know, got back into... Uh, claiming his piece of this, and uh, and going back to Renee, I, I knew DeHinden pretty well. I knew Green and Titmus, but not as well as I knew DeHinden. And <laughs> there were definitely some shady things going on. He never got he never got any rights to the uh, film. Mrs. Patterson said she never she dug her heels and never gave it to him. Uh, he did own a hundred percent of the still rights. You know, I, I think Roger gave him sixty percent, and he badgered Mrs. Patterson for years. And she finally caved in and gave him the remaining 40%. But, <clears throat> you know, everybody says, well, the original film vanished. Uh, it did. I, I, knew, I knew directly that it did because I saw it in Renee's safe. Uh, there was, Mrs. Patterson told me her side of the story was he had come through. He used to go to Bluff Creek every year for a couple of weeks. And a lot of the times he'd come through and visit me for a day or two on his way home. And on one of these trips... Um, she he had arranged with her she said okay i'll talk to you discussion whatever about the rights to the film and the film was in her attorney's office with the two remaining casts roger had cast three cast three footprints that day one broke there were two remaining a left and a right uh so the original cast were with the film on the attorney's desk and for some unknown reason she said the attorney's office was not locked he was out of office uh they knew renee was in Yakima, uh, the film and the original cast vanished. Nobody knew who took them. So we fast forward a little bit. This was in the mid 80s, sometime I was at Renee's home uh, at the Richmond Gun Club, and we were talking about the film. And, I, and he said he had it on slides. I said, Well, pull the slides out, let's take a look. So we were uh, looking at this, and he showed me. He says, Well, this is, this is the original film in his uh, safe, and he actually loaned me those two original footprint casts that I made molds from. So I knew what Mrs. Patterson said was true, that he had taken the film and the casts. Um, you know, where all that stuff is today, who knows. But uh, anyway, that that was just kind of my tidbit. And uh, we had had Bill Munns on for two episodes of the show a while back. And Bill's really, you know, awesome guy. Did an excellent job discussing, you know, all the details about why the film could not have been hoaxed. Hmm. Well, I bought a copy of the Patterson film from Mrs. Patterson. From uh, her attorneys was Marquise, and Marquise, I think, is the name. And uh, they made me a, a video copy, supposedly from the original film. This was in 1984, I think. 80, I'd have to look it up. And uh, yeah, it was, so, some, it was sometime around then. I think the original vanished. Well, it was uh, it was right before that then, yeah. Because uh, supposedly the attorneys said uh, uh, it was the copy they were going to make us from the film, and uh, uh, yeah, so it was um, pretty much. Uh, which I felt very lucky to be able to get it. Oh, absolutely. Uh, the, and I was at it when I was doing. When I did a lecture to the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service in 91 in uh, West Virginia, um, they made me some DVD copies from that. And uh, and it's it's pretty spectacular. I mean, even the original, even with all the stuff that's been done to it since then, stabilizing and enhancing and all this sort of thing, it's still pretty, uh, pretty intense. And... Um, I had on when I had my podcast show. I w was lucky enough to get John Green and uh, Bob Gimlin on the same show, and that was the only time they ever did an interview interview together. And it was there interesting to hear those two together and their, their perspectives about it. And in fact, uh, I was I was taking kind of a compromise because basically I had a deal set up with a video corporation in Indianapolis, Indiana. 
and I'd already had it lined up with Bob, and I already had it lined up with John, that we were going to ride back to the film site. Bob was going to bring the horses down from the Yakima, and we were going to film that, and then we are going to build a campfire back by the film site, and basically film John and Bob talking about that, talking about that day from the very beginning to the end. And that would have made one heck of a documentary. It would have been, for the true Sasquatch enthusiast or researcher, it, it would have been number one. But uh, the company, after they saw Sasquatch Legend Meets Science and saw the special effects, they said, well, we can't do that. There's a quarter million dollars in special effects. I said, we're not going to do special effects. Because we're going to do a legitimate, honest documentary from the guys that know so I, I was kind of sad that we didn't get that put together completely, but uh, just having him on the same podcast was pretty phenomenal. Yeah, that's very interesting. Um, <clears throat> and Larry, you did a uh, you said you did a presentation for uh, Fish and Wildlife. Was it for the state of Virginia or was it uh, uh, national? It was national. It was. Uh, we did it at the National Conservation Training Center. It was the only time the Fish, U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service has ever hosted or entertained anything on the subject of Bigfoot. And when I went in there, one of the historians presented me with a press release that had been issued in the 70s from the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service, what they would do if a Sasquatch or Bigfoot body was ever brought in, the complete uh, rundown of the different steps they would take. The first would be classified as an endangered species. The second, basically, send a National Guard in in the area that had been killed, uh, completely have it uh, closed off so scientists could get in there. They had it all worked out. I mean, the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service has not been ignorant about this. And when I did that talk, uh, John Green told me, he said, Larry, because I sent him copies of the actual lecture that I did, and also, we did a one-hour TV broadcast for the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Net Network that went out to over 1,200 outlets all across the country. And uh, he said that that was probably the most important thing in Bigfoot research next to the Patterson-Gimlin film, to have such a legitimate agency. And they not only brought me in once, but they brought me in twice to do a lecture for them on Sasquatch. And one of the craziest things, we, I was, when I did that lecture... I was speaking to scientists, uh, rangers, secret service people, different people in law enforcement, conservation. And at the end of the lecture, I always say, how many of you just think this is a big load of crap? <laughs> and uh, one hand went up, and it was from a friend of mine who was basically just trying to harass me. And then after I did the lecture, I received so many calls and emails from different people in other parts of the country that had seen something had an experience that they were always afraid to talk about because of job security and how what the uh, what the, uh, the superiors would think about that. I mean, it was absolutely incredible. And then uh, years later, I had the opportunity to to interview and talk extensively with Bob Jackson, the Yellowstone Park Ranger, who for 30-plus years patrolled the most remote area of Yellowstone by himself hunting poachers. And he arrested more poachers in Yellowstone than all the other rangers combined. And Bob Jackson told me about his sighting of a Sasquatch in Yellowstone National Park and had all the trail crews and so forth had found footprints and had seen things in Yellowstone. And he flat does not care if anybody believes him or not. And, you know, his testimony has put people in prison. It's cost them tens of thousands of dollars, cost them their equipment. And if he says, if he says, I observed a Sasquatch stalking a deer in Yellowstone National Park, you have to believe him. I mean, when he tells the story, it is so, uh, it, it's incredible. In fact, for a lot of people that heard the interview, they said that basically closed. It. it did for me as far as trying to prove the existence of these things. It was done after that. I said, well, I, you know, I was right all these years. So they, they absolutely do exist. You know, I, I never really had any doubts, but after the Bob Jackson uh, interview, it was done. You know, I was done. I, I, I could look at people. They could look at me, some of these 
conferences that go on, and they kind of give you that odd look like, you believe in this? And I give them that odd look right back like, I don't care (laughs) what you think of me or anything, brother. So just move along. (laughs) It's just, it's, uh, you know, it's, it's, it's done. It's over for me. You know, they, they absolutely do exist. Hey, uh, Larry, I got a question for you. Um, what do you think of, and are you familiar, <clears throat> excuse me, familiar with the uh, 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 controversy or conspiracy uh, of a massacre? You know, based on your talks with uh, Green and Titmus and, and Bob Gimlin, um, what are your thoughts about there was a massacre there and uh, of, of you know, several Bigfoot? That's the stupidest, dumbest thing that anybody's ever come up with. Can you imagine what a Sasquatch body would be worth? It'd be worth millions. John Green spent, uh, you know, three quarters of his life trying to prove their existence. And if he knew where some were buried or there's parts of something buried, you wouldn't think he would try and bring them out of that. That's just, just stupid. That's just dumb. I mean, I, that's, that's every time it comes, it seems like it's on a cycle. It comes up every 10 years. They, they've all, John scoffed at it. And, and of course, Bob does. He, <laughs> I called Bob a couple weeks ago and talked to him. I wondering, you know, his, he flat doesn't care. You know, he wasn't too <laughs> worked up about it. He said, ah, they're at it again. And I said, yeah. I said, does it aggravate you? Oh, he said, it aggravates me. But I don't care. You know, I just don't care. It's a bunch of fat guys on computers, you know, coming up with this stuff. It's just silly. It's just stupid. I got to agree with you 100%. <laughs> Especially that last part. A bunch of fat guys on computers, probably in their mom's basement. <laughs> well, you know, I... I, I, I um, hmm. I talked to, I talked to, I've always said the most interesting thing about this, the Bigfoot Sasquatch thing is not the researchers, but the people that actually have the sightings and the encounters and so forth. That to me is the fun part of it. That's what I enjoy. And uh, I, I laughed at uh, these, these research groups. I talked to them. I said, hey, I said, you guys uh, go out and do your research. Do you get on your camouflage? Of course, you know that most of them have camouflage on all the time. And I said, do you actually think when you're walking through the woods in your camouflage looking for Bigfoot that they don't see you? <laughs> I said, that's just plain silly. I mean, you're talking about, I liked what one interpretation someone gave. He says, uh, in the daytime, the Sasquatch shares the forest. In the nighttime, they own the forest. Because, the, you know, for one thing, an animal that's seven, eight foot tall can be flat and visible at night just because of their camouflage and coloration. I mean, that's what I, uh, the, the Not Finding Bigfoot show. I thought, man, they're just making silly television. These guys walking around with these cameras and hanging on poles and stuff in the dark. They're not going to shoot any footage of a Sasquatch. It's not going to happen. This is just dumb television. What when, when have all the credible films been shot? In the daytime. Patterson Gimlin film, the Freeman film. Daytime, not nighttime. That's just silly. That's just dumb. And, and the reenactments that they do, oh, my God. <laughs> it's almost an assault on one's intelligence. I just, I just... <laughs> I just can't. I just have a problem with it. It's just, uh, and God love them. I'm glad Cliff and Bobo and Matt all get a paycheck for that, doing that, I would hope. But uh, it's not doing anything for Bigfoot research. The only thing it's done is got a lot of younger people interested in it. And if that's what it takes to get them in the outdoors to go hiking and whatever, good for them. That's, that's a good thing. But, uh, yeah, it's, it's just, just pitiful. There's really well, a legend of uh, science. Go, go ahead. Well, I was, I, I was curious, um, <clears throat> what are some of the most interesting stories that you've heard from witnesses? Well, I, I live here in West Central Indiana. And uh, when we bought this place, I knew of a a sighting not too far from here. 
And what had actually occurred is uh, three guys went sc- were going squirrel hunting, dad, his son, and a friend of his son. And they were going to go back in this woods right up next to their property. Pretty good acreage. And it's about, I don't know, if I hopped in my car, I'd be there in about three minutes. And they got back there before daybreak. And they're just, and they're basically setting up on the ridges. And they're parallel with one another, probably uh, 75, 100 yards apart from each other. And um, the boy, his son, is, is, sitting there in the darkness in the woods and he can hear something moving through the woods and his first thought is wow he says that has to be the biggest buck i've ever heard he says i got to get a look at this thing because when trees when deer season comes this is where i'm going to set up my tree stand so he kind of crawls over the top of this ridge to try to get a look at this deer and he looks to the valley below and he doesn't see anything the first time he looks so he keeps looking, and finally he notices something standing up against a tree. And it kind of comes around the tree, and he can get a better look at it. And he can see it's black in color. It's got the, the huge head, the long arms. And it was about six and a half, seven feet tall. Well, the boy, of course, he had a shotgun on him. He raises that shotgun up and aims it toward this thing. And as soon as he raised that shotgun up, this thing charged him two or three steps. Well, basically, that just uh, he that just completely threw him off. He his knees turned to jelly. He slid down that tree he was leaned up against, and that moment of hesitation, this thing takes off. And while it's taking off, it starts screaming. And I asked him, I said, how fast did it run? He says, it ran as fast as any deer, except the only thing is the smaller trees it ran over, the larger trees, of course, it ran around. And he said the screams that it was, that it was uh, doing, he said they became more aggressive the farther away it got from him. Well, right away, that tells me primate behavior, or ape, even though I know the Sasquatch, they're not apes. But that's very primate-like behavior because, you know, it's a troop of baboons. When they first see the, the lion, you know, it's a couple of oh, 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 uh, grunts. And then the farther away the lions get from them, the braver that they become. Well, that's what this thing was doing. So dad can hear all this going on. So he runs over and he finds his son. His son is leaning up against a tree and he can, completely cannot talk. I mean, he is so miscombobulated. He's just, he's just a mess. So they go looking for his friend, and they can't find him. What in the world's happened to him? So they get back to the, the house, and they call the conservation officer. Well, the conservation officer finds out that the, her friend had ran home three miles because he saw it all happening. He watched it all come down. He saw the thing run through the trees, the screams, everything. But the conservation officer kept the two boys apart. And he said, Larry, he said, I had them draw what they saw. Now, they were not artists, but they both drew the same thing. Well, when he went there to investigate the spot, and he took the, the, the one boy back that had, had the sighting, they're walking by his car, and the kid says to the, the conservation officer, he says, well, what are you taking back there? He says, what do you mean? A weapon. He says, well, I've got one right here on my hip. And then the kid looks at it and says, no, 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 no. What I saw, that won't do you any good. We, you need to take a big gun. So uh, he did. And they went back there, and he found a 16-inch footprint. It was the same old deal, though. He said, Larry, I couldn't tell anybody that what I'd found. I couldn't, you know, I, I entertained this family. You know, I listened to their story, but I couldn't write a report on this. They'd think I'm nuts. So uh, he didn't. But uh, the most amazing thing is that family uh, moved out of that area just weeks after this all had happened. They got out of there. I moved into it. <laughs> so. Wow. <laughs> yeah, that's that's pretty amazing. So the conservation officer, he made a decision to uh, really what could he write, right? What kind of an incident report could he write up on that? 
Yeah, he, he can't. And uh, he he show he. In fact, we were doing a, another investigation on a big cat because I have you know big cats and things here for my wildlife lecture work I do. And uh, we were doing we were tracking down uh, some turkeys that supposedly had been killed by a lion. And it turned out it was a, an escaped mountain lion from about 40 miles away. But um, uh, he, he pointed, he said, there's the woods Larry. And that's just right around, around the corner from my house. And um, years ago, we were putting in a new bear enclosure here. I had some friends from Florida uh, helping me on it. And I'd gone off to buy tiger food for that day and went into town. I come back and they said, Larry, he said, there's something that was moving down through your valley right behind your house. He said, sounded big. We didn't see nothing, but it sounded big. So I didn't say anything to him. You know, I just go, huh, well, I'll be. So that night, I'm feeding the cats. And we had, at that time, we had one Siberian tiger, which was just, he was just mammoth. And basically, when you took his food up to him, he thought he had to make a kill every night. He'd get highly aggressive. So what we would do is we moved him from one side of the uh, is a facility to the other, and we had a guillotine door so we could close him in it and get the food in there and then open him back up. Well, I'm walking up to his enclosure that night with the bucket of food, and he's not charging. He's not coming up or anything. I said, what the hell? So I think, so I'm looking down through the, his enclosure, and it was pretty dark. It was hard to see. And I can see him clear at the other end, and he's not paying any attention to me whatsoever. He's looking straight back into the woods. And he looked like one of those statues that you see in front of someone's house of a lion, except this was a tiger. And I looked down, all my other cats were kind of in a row, and my mountain lions, my lion, my other two tigers, they were all looking straight back into that valley at the same thing he was. Now, I really kicked myself because I, what I should have done, and I didn't think about it much at the time. In fact, I didn't really put two and two together. I should have walked around my alligator building and walked back in the woods because I would have probably ran into something. Because it was back there, all those cats told me. Deer and that sort of thing, wouldn't, that, they, that, that, that wouldn't even get their attention. I mean, it had to be something pretty impressive. And for that, to, that big Siberian tiger not to charge me for his food that night, that was completely out of character. I mean, that, that is the once and only time he ever did that. Just clear out the other end. Just sitting there, completely focused to the back woods behind our house. Hey, Larry, let me ask, um, can you elaborate on primate behavior? What do you mean? Like, as as can, uh, it, it, uh, maybe compared to, uh, to Bigfoot, other primates? Well, it's not an ape, because if the Sasquatch was an ape, we would already have one. We would already have one in a zoo somewhere, or there would be one mounted in a museum. Because, look, at the mountain gorilla went undiscovered for so long. I mean, the people that lived in the mountains of Africa and Uganda would talk about it, but the scientists, of course, didn't believe them. And till they went up in those mountains and discovered that they did exist. And this was in the early 1900s. And I, I have said this. That if Roger Patterson and Bob Gimlin had doctor in front of their names when they shot that footage, it would have been all over. The mystery would have been solved. The, the existence would have been proven because of that film footage. But because it was just two cowboys from Washington, and they weren't scientists, they weren't PhDs, they weren't doctors, nobody gave them any credibility whatsoever. And as far as primate behavior... A lot of animals, I mean, primates' intelligence is far deeper than ourselves. I mean, when you look in the eyes of a gorilla, when you look in the eyes of an orangutan, a chimp, you see so much. I mean, I can go in Walmart and look in some people's eyes, and I don't see nothing. <laughs> I mean, it's like, but, but these primates, you know, their behavior is, and there are certain things that the uh, Sasquatch does that uh, they might be considered ape-like. The only reason is that is think about it. They exist in the wild 24-7, all weather conditions, and they, can, and they can figure out a way to survive. People have said 
how can there be enough food for for a Sasquatch to exist in these forests? Well, bears do, and you know, bears are pretty. And their diet we've always thought was very similar to that of a bear. And you know, basically, their hors d'oeuvre, the Sasquatch in this part of the country, that they can find readily as far as survival and food, is a possum. I mean, the woods are filled with them. I mean, they have no problem. And this last week, well, no, I take it back. It's been three weeks ago. On my, I do a Facebook live show at 10 o'clock on Friday night. I had a fella call in. His name is Austin. And he was hunting in southern Indiana. And he was up in a tree stand, and he saw a deer. And so he was, you know, he was getting ready to take this deer. And all of a sudden, out of the brush, both the Sasquatch basically just punched that deer right in the rib cage. It went to the ground. And then he grabbed it by the legs and beat it up against a tree and killed it. And then basically just tucked it up underneath, underneath its arm and walked off. And this fellow, when he tells us what he had seen, he says, he's, he's quite truthful. He says, it's really, really changed my life. He says, I used to be an avid hunter. He says, now when I go in the woods, I look over my shoulder the entire time. I said, it's kind of taken the fun out of it, but I'm, he said, man, he said, I'm so fascinated with it. In fact, I'm a graphic illustrator, and we were going to get together because he had a really good look at the face of this thing. And uh, kind of like a police forensic thing, we're going to, uh, I'm going to draw what he saw that day. Yeah, now, you, you've worked with animals a long time, right? Can you tell us a little bit about your profession and how, how long you've worked with animals? Uh, I've worked with animals over, uh, been taking animals to schools for over 42 years. Done uh, work with Mutual of Omaha's Wild Kingdom, Discovery Channel, Animal Planet. Lectured for the uh, Audubon Society, the Explorers Club. Um, but basically, my foundation is uh, the schools, and I. And at one time, I was in close to 200 schools a year where we take animals in and present them realizing we're not speaking to a group of future zoologists, but we're speaking to a group of future voters that are going to vote for people that want to support our national parks and national forests and not turn them over to uh, corporate corporate America for uh, mineral rights or oil rights and keep uh, the wild wild. But uh, I've done that for 41 years, and part of my work is with Jim Fowler, who was the co-host of the old television program, YouTube of Omaha's Wild Kingdom. In fact, Jim told the story. We were in uh, Columbus, Georgia, Callaway Gardens one morning for breakfast. We'd been doing it. We'd done a lecture there that, that night before. And um, he told about his recent trip to Russia for ABC television, and they uh, wanted to film the Russian brown bear. Well, all the Russian guides wanted to talk about was Sasquatch because they had seen something in those mountains that was the same thing that had been reported in Oregon, Washington, Northern California, British Columbia, Alberta, Canada. And uh, so I, and I asked him, I said, what do you think, Jim? And he said, well, I see. he said, those guides certainly were uh, convinced that there was something in those mountains. And, and I've talked to a few people. In fact, I've talked to Ron Moorhead the other day and he'd been to Russia and talked to these people, and uh, he said, "Yeah, he said the Russians are totally convinced of, the, of its existence." So, who knows? We might have got if he was still with us. We might have got him on an expedition sometime. So I think Marlin did go up in the Himalayas, and they did some did some big or Yeti research. Perkins, Marlin Perkins. Wow. And um, what other parts of the, the world and uh, what part of the country, this country, do you think that most sightings come from or that you've heard of personally? Or, or do you know any any other like witness stories from other parts of the country? Oh, yeah. I'm from Ohio, from uh, uh, Washington. Um, from Washington, I'll, I'll tell you, I was um, uh, talking to a, a fellow that had... Um, cabin that was five miles south of the Canadian border in Washington, and he'd had several sightings. In fact, he had someone stay at that cabin, and he told him, he says, uh, now we've got, there's Sasquatches in these woods, so, you know, 
uh, if you see something, don't be surprised. He said, oh, okay. So he didn't, he didn't believe him, but he said, okay. So I guess the next day, in the middle of the daytime, he looks up, this guy that was using his cabin looked out and uh, saw a Sasquatch standing up next to a tree. He said, oh, my God, there it is. So he just, he, you know, he basically he said he wanted to try and scare it. So he was going to shoot the tree next to it and scare it off. Well, he pulled that trigger, and this thing moved its head enough that that bullet caught it right below the eye, and it dropped like a sack of potatoes. And within two, three, four seconds, there was another one that basically grabbed the body of the one that he just shot, tossed it up over his shoulder, and walked off in the forest with it. Well, he called him up, this guy that owned the cabin, he, his friend called him up, he told him what had happened. He said, why did you do that for? I mean, my God, I told you that these things were here. What you, what? He says, don't leave that cabin until the morning. He says, lock all the doors. And I guess all night, they beat on that cabin, they threw rocks at it, hogs and so forth, and come morning, he was out of there. Well, he also told me, a friend of his, had a cabin just down the road, and they were over there one night, and it was after dark, and his friend had this Rottweiler dog. And uh, they were sitting on the porch, and they could hear something out in the woods. Well, they're listening to it for a little bit, and they said, well, hell, there they there's a Sasquatch is right out there right now, because this guy that owned his cabin, you know, he was fairly familiar with them. Well, the Rottweiler was staying on the porch, and the Rottweiler was just doing a low growl. Well, Ron Moorhead, you know, we were talking about their ability for vocalization, whether they can imitate just about anything they want to, including the human voice. Well, those guys are standing there on that or on that pat, that porch, that patio, and all of a sudden, out of the forest, they can hear these things calling the dog, Moogly, Moogly, Moogly. And they said when they heard that, they decided they were going back into the cabin, and the Rottweiler led the way. I mean, it was like, that was uh, completely disconcerting to them. You know, that's an amazing story, uh, especially the one, um, you know, where, where he shot it, and, and then moments later, it just... You know, it was taken away by one of its uh, family members or companions or whatever. And I like the part about stay in the cabin. <laughs> Good well, advice, right? Well, it's like Fred Beck and the deal at Eighth Canyon. That, that, that basically the same thing happened to those guys. And, you know, you have to think about that story from Eighth Canyon. Those were miners in the 20s, 1920s, and they, they were tough individuals. And those things basically drove them out of the cabin, but they left all their equipment. I mean, they didn't go back to get that equipment. They left it, you know, their livelihood. So there had to be something going on there because, let's face it, those guys are just badass outdoorsmen. I mean, they, they were... So, uh, yeah, basically the same... And we've heard that story before where they where they've done that. I had a fellow in Morgan Monroe State Forest had a house next to it, basically, and he had shot shot one or shot at one with a, with a machine gun, and for the longest time after that happened, his he was harassed. I mean, they'd come up, eat on the side of his house, they'd throw rocks, and so forth, and uh, yeah. In fact, when he shot that one, he thought, though he never found the body, he never saw blood, they basically shot it in darkness that that next morning they were going to see if it what it was, and if it was a human body, they were just going to bury it and not let anybody, let anybody know what had happened. But uh, they found a trail behind his house, and he says it wasn't a deer trail because it wasn't straight across the ridges like deer trails usually are. And uh, he said that uh, it made all these weird twists and turns, and then he finally figured it out that every time it would make a weird twist, He'd look up, and there'd be a tree limb hanging down about seven feet. In other words, instead of ducking underneath the tree limb, the, the, the things were simply walking around it. And when he got back to the, where the trail ended, he said there was a huge bear spot on this ridge right behind his house. And he said he looked in that bear spot, 
and there was all these different sizes of footprints. But from that spot, whatever was standing there had a com- perfect view of his house and could see anything coming or going. Wow, that's amazing. Hey, um, have you heard any stories from hunters where they've uh, had an encounter with these things? Well, that's needless to say, they've had several, and I've talked to more than one hunter that's had one in their sights, but their first thing, including Austin, the one that watched that Bigfoot uh, kill that deer, that his fir- first thought was the, the rifle he had that day would not do him any good. And here's the problem. Here's the problem. If one wanting to shoot one. As I, as I said earlier, you see one, but there's two, three, four, five you don't see. And most of your primates are very protective toward one another. And even the human, of course, is. The story of uh, a photographer watching a troop of baboons, and he's filming these baboons, and he can see in the brush a leopard trying to stalk the baboons coming through the brush, and all of a sudden the leopard bolts, and he manages to catch a young one in his jaws, and as soon as that young baboon screamed, the entire troop attacked the leopard. And when they finished, there wasn't a piece of that leopard that was the size of your hand. They completely destroyed it. And for the... uh, Sasquatch, you know, you, you shoot one of them. If you don't kill, it's the main thing. You know, what, what are you going to deal with then? But what are the other ones going to do? And, and it brings me back to this, this incident that occurred in an Indian reservation up in um, uh, northern Washington where these three young men went to run the salmon traps and they never come back. Well, the elders went to look for him. Now, the first body they found was underneath a pile of boulders. The second body they found was basically just uh, jelly and had completely been ripped apart and left in a pile. The third one they found was laying on the ground, but they could see what had happened because something had grabbed that young man by the ankle and beat him up against a tree because all the trees around that body were covered with brain tissue. And I've heard more than one account of that, well, the, the guy in Bloomington, when he said it killed that deer by beating it up against a tree. And I've talked to sheriffs in the West that have found coyotes that have been beaten up against trees, whereas the night before they'd hear this, these t- horrible screams and so forth and, and when he went to investigate, that's what he would find. So, um, and then I had a young Native American woman in this national, in this forest here in southern Indiana. I was doing a television interview, and I never let out the location at all. But uh, she called me up. She says, you're talking about this place. I said, well, you're right. She says, and she just said, as a matter of fact, it's going to be, she says, well, there's, there's five of them, of them in there. I said, really? I said, how do you know that? She said, I know. He said, she said, I can call them in. But, but if you're with me, he said, be, realize that you will be risking your life. I said, why is that? He said, because if you get between a male and a female, or a male and a baby, that the male will grab you by your ankles and beat you up against a tree. That's how he'll kill you. So, you know, I hear the same stories over and over and over again. You know, it kind of makes me think, huh, well, that behavior must be pretty common among these things. I don't know if I answered your question or not. (laughs) 100%. Absolutely. Um, You know, and what you mentioned about the coyotes, have you... Have you seen anything like that, or have you heard other stories where you find? Because I've heard stories where people have found coyotes with their hind legs broken, and it has been impaled on a tree branch, and one of those broken yeah. a broken tree branch. Mm-hmm. Well, yeah. yeah. Well, that's what did it. <laughs> uh, because what other animal could or would do that? And, and I can think of that lives in uh, at least the forest here in the Indiana and Ohio and. You know, bear wouldn't do that. Mountain lion, of course, wouldn't do that. And my theory is, too, 
uh, when we talk about theories, is that the Sasquatches track the mountain lions. And they what they do is they wait for the mountain lion to make the kill many times. And once the mountain lion is made to kill, and usually when they do, they let out a scream or whatever. Uh, so that will attract a Sasquatch in a heartbeat. And uh, I think, and they move the mountain lions off the kill, and they take the, the prey. And they do the same thing to deer hunters. I've talked to deer hunters that have shot a deer, went up to, walked up to it to tag it and cut it and all that. And they watch this thing come out of the forest, grab the deer, give them a look like, oh, well, too bad, it's mine, and uh, walk off into the forest with their deer. So it's uh, hunters have had a lot, a lot of dealings with them. Oh, one hunter was in the uh, same forest Cody was talking about, and he was playing a distressed uh, rabbit call, which is, by the way, probably <laughs> one of the best things you can play if you want to attract a Sasquatch. So after you see one and you, and you have a chance to observe it for a second, my question is always, why do you want to attract it? I mean, <laughs> I kind of laugh about that. I said, what do you think <laughs> will happen if you attract the Sasquatch? Well, this guy, he was up in a tree, and the Sasquatch come out of the woods and uh, looked up the tree at him, took a couple laps around the tree, and then walked off in the forest. So the guy spent the entire day at that tree stand. He was afraid to come down. Then I had a friend in uh, southern Indiana. He, he and his brother went deer hunting. And his brother would uh, uh, hunt out of a stand. And he would hunt on the ground. So his brother was walking back to the stand. He hadn't been back there very long. And he heard, and, uh, he heard a shot. And he said, oh, my gosh, he's got a deer already. Then he can hear something coming through the woods. He says, oh, well, he's driving it right toward me. I'm ready. So he raised his rifle, expecting to see a deer come out of the brush and briars. No, it wasn't a deer. It was about a six-foot Sasquatch. And it looked him right in the eye and gave this horrified look and then made a right-hand turn. He says it was gone in a flash. And, you know, he said, and I've heard so many times before, when people see how fast they are, how quick, they realize that when they're in the forest, if these things wanted them. They they would take care of that with no problem. But the speed that they can move, that's probably one of the most impressive things about people that have these sightings. When they talk about how they go across the highway in about two steps and go up a hill so amazingly fast, and like Bob Titmus said, climbed up that cliff by using their fingers and feeling for cracks that quickly they did that. These things are so physically superior. I mean, we're just kind of pitiful when we walk in the woods compared to these things. I mean, it's just not even funny. I, and I've always said they've got to have a sense of humor because <laughs> they're standing there in the woods and they see some big old fat guy waddling through the forest on his Sasquatch expedition and they're looking around and saying, where's a rock? <laughs> I want to chuck a rock at him. <laughs> this will be funny. So, uh, yeah. Yeah, so, uh, Larry, let me ask, because, uh, you know, Cody told us a story about him getting thrown at a rack. How often do they do this, do you think? And why do they do they do it to intimidate people and give them a warning, or do they actually try to go for the kill? I, we can't determine that, because here's the reason they haven't, it has, they haven't been filmed uh, very well, except for the Patterson film. Uh, is because these things are totally unpredictable. Totally unpredictable. There's nothing predictable about one. Zero. So we can't really say, we could say, maybe, do they do it out of a No, I don't know. You know, it's, it's, uh, it could be, you know, an intimidation thing. There's a number of reasons that uh, they would do it, you know, and that's behavior that's, uh, that gorillas do it and orangutans do it and so forth and, and uh, so, you know, it's and rock throwing and tree knocking. Uh, well, I'll, I had a, I didn't know a fellow that worked for the Green Castle here in Indiana, Waterworks. And I was giving a talk, and he'd come, he waited till about everybody was gone. He came up to me, he said, I want to tell you a little story. I said, okay. He says, I was fly fishing in Washington. He says, yeah. He says, we were getting ready to go out in the middle of this river. And all of a sudden, out of the forest, it looked like it had been catapulted. 
So here comes a rock that's about three or 400 pounds flying out of the forest and lands in the middle of that river. And he said, when we saw that, we just brought our lines in and put them in the car or fishing equipment, and we left. So that was an intimidation. That definitely was. I mean, to throw a rock that size. Now, I was uh, investigating a report in northern Indiana where one had moved into a camp, guys were camping, and it was throwing rocks at them. But these rocks were quite, they were large. And he said, he just got back from Vietnam. He'd been through some heavy combat. He did two tours. He'd seen horrible things. And he said, when that thing threw those rocks through the forest, he sa- it sounded like those shells, these mortars that we hear go come through the forest. You hear the sound of breaking leaves. He said, the only difference was there was no explosion at the end. And he said, this thing did that. He said, they picked up their, their boat and knocked it around and then just come up to the camp and circled their camp all night. Then the next morning, they, <laughs> they left. And he said that even after all that combat he endured in Vietnam, he said that he'd never been so scared in his entire life. Wow. Larry, i got to say, you have... Um Absolutely, some incredible stories and encounters and um, stuff to share with everybody. Um, so I'm just going to ask, we're going to wrap it up, but uh, any final thoughts uh, from Cody, from Larry? Go ahead, Cody. Well, uh, thanks uh, for having me on the show today. However brief it may have been, I appreciate it. It was pretty cool. But uh, I, I hope, uh, go ahead. Well, I was going to say, no, great having you on, Cody. We're going to have to have you on in the, uh, in the future and uh, keep us updated with uh, your activity that you're finding there. And uh, Larry, I just got to thank you for, uh, you just got a plethora of information, just fascinating. And uh, again, we're going to have to have you uh, on in a future episode. Yeah, uh we're on Facebook Live every Friday night at 10 o'clock. Uh, Cody and I have a Facebook page, Footers Forum, that uh, you can check out. And there's uh, a lot of interesting stuff on there. Cody basically runs that, that animal. So uh, he's done a great job with it. But uh, Cody's a young researcher, and he's, he's getting, you know, he's very enthusiastic. So that's what it's going to take. Uh, you know, he'll have a lot of fun in the process. And, uh, and it'll all be positive, we hope. Well, fellas, great information. Much appreciated. Um, thanks for taking the time to be with us today. Thanks, Beth. Thanks for listening to this episode of Creek Devil. If you or anyone you know has had an encounter with these creatures, please contact us at williamjevning at yahoo.com. That's William, J-E-V-N-I-N-G, at yahoo.com. All communication is confidential. Join us for another program next week. And until then, keep your eyes open out there.